Hi there. I'm Donna Worsley, and I'm going to be talking to you this morning about why your palm doesn't look as good as you'd like it to look, or what maybe is making your palm sick. And basically, we're going to be talking about palm deficiencies and disorders. Basically, palm, what are you not feeding your palm, uh, or palm diseases, and then we'll even talk about some insects that can affect palms. And I'm having problems. Okay, here we go. The first thing we're going to deal with is indeed nutritional deficiencies. So as we take a look here, coming up on your screen, you're seeing that these are the nutritional deficiencies that most often will affect palms. The first one being nitrogen. The second one being potassium. And this is a very important nutrient. You're going to hear more about that in a little bit. Magnesium is another essential ingredient that palm trees do indeed need. Iron. Manganese. And finally, boron. And we're going to talk about each one of these and what it's going to look like or what your palm tree will look like if you have this deficiency in your landscape. I want you to notice that those first top three, nitrogen, potassium, and magnesium, are probably one of the, the three most important ones. But then we'll hop down, and then the last one, the fifth one, we're going to, or the fourth one, I guess it's the fourth one. Manganese is also pretty important. So let's get started. First of all, we have to understand how do you do this in the first place? How do you actually fertilize your palms? You're seeing up on your screen right now. Uh, you're seeing two different palm labels, a palm fertilizer, but you'll notice that in both cases, they have the same numbers. You're seeing numbers that say 8 to 12. So in effect, that's number A here. In to fertilize your palms, we want you to be using a palm special fertilizer, and you're going to be looking for numbers that perhaps will be an 8, 4, 12, 4, and 8, 2, 12, 4. And let's talk about what those numbers really are. That first number is indeed nitrogen. Uh, and notice that the nitrogen level is really less than what the potassium level is, which is that third number. The middle number is phosphorus. And we live in a world that has lots of phosphorus naturally in our soils. So we don't really need a whole lot of phosphorus because it's already there. Uh, that's why you're seeing a very low middle number or even it could sometimes you can find 8012 also. Uh, and then that four that you're not seeing on the fertilizer label per se because you probably can't really read that one. Uh, that four is really then the magnesium. When you buy Palm Special Fertilizer, you want to make sure that 100% of that fertilizer is indeed controlled release form. Uh, that means it's coated. Uh, it means that typically uh, it will say that it's uh, keserite or it will say sulfur coated, something like that on the, the, on the actual Palm Fertilizer label. And that's important because what controlled release does is it means it does not release all of those nutrients at the very beginning, the first time it's watered in, it will not release everything. And so gradually over the course of, I'm gonna say three months, because it's ideally you wanna be, you wanna be fertilizing your palm tree every three months, four times a year if possible. And you're gonna do that. And then I, you see here, it says broadcast using a rotary spreader. If you don't have a lot of palm trees, you're probably not going to be using a rotary spreader. But by broadcast, I mean you are not going to put all of your fertilizer in a small ring around the trunk. Oftentimes we see that happening. What you need to realize is that your palm tree roots, the roots of that palm tree, about the size, each root is about the size of your little finger, actually extend out from your palm trunk anywhere from 25 to 50 foot. That means you have palm roots probably throughout your landscape if you have very many palms in your landscape. Uh, so by that, when I say broadcast, I mean, it could be something as simple as filling your bucket with fertilizer, taking a cup and spreading it around that way. But I mean, you need to get the, the fertilizer out to the palm canopy and out as far as those roots uh, are. So please don't just put it right around the base of the trunk. Also, do not dig holes and try to pour fertilizer in the holes or even use fertilizer spikes. 
because all that does is indeed just put the fertilizer in one little area. Um, so that's not the best way to fertilize your palms. You'll see there it says that you want to apply one and a half pounds of actual fertilizer. That's all the fertilizer. You're not worried about how much nitrogen's in it or anything there. Uh, remember I just said every three months. Um, and if you're trying to figure out what's one and a half pounds, simply put it in a bucket, put it on your you know, bathroom scales and weigh it, and you'll figure that's exactly how it's going to be. Uh, I also need to say that when I talk about fertilizing every three months or four times a year, one of the issues that we have in Charlotte County as well as other counties is that in our rainy season, we have a fertilizer ordinance that tells us that we're really not supposed to be using any fertilizer that has nitrogen in it during that rainy season. So basically, first of June to end of September. So what do you do then? How do you fertilize your palm? Well, the best way to do that is to try to find a product that's 0016. By that, I mean it's actually got, it's all, all potassium. That's exactly what you're putting down. And I say try. Uh, I will have to be very honest with you. Sometimes I've had a whole lot of difficulty finding that. Best source if you need to buy lots of palm uh, fertilizer in Charlotte County is probably up at site one landscape because they do carry uh, large quantities of that fertilizer. Okay, let's start talking about those nutrition deficiencies. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is nitrogen. And nitrogen is so easy to recognize because basically the palm looks all yellow <laughs> or it looks like it's got a lot of yellow fronds on it. Uh, so you're going to see all the fronds are yellow or all those older fronds are turning yellow. Uh, and that's a sure, sure sign that it's, an, it's nitrogen deficiency. How do you correct nitrogen deficiency? Well, it's pretty easy to correct. All you have to do is put some nitrogen fertilizer on and it will start to green up your palm. Uh, again, ideally, you're probably better to get started fertilizing again with a palm special fertilizer. Uh, because for many of you, one of the frustrations you have is that you've moved into a new home or a landscape that nobody's been taking care of the palms. So then you're trying to figure out exactly what is indeed wrong. So nitrogen deficiency, overall yellowing of the entire palm. Potassium deficiency, and this is probably the number one deficiency that we find throughout all of our palm species. Uh, although it does show up more oftentimes uh, in royal palms, coconut palms, uh, queen areca, all of the, you know, but you actually can get potassium deficiency in any palm. It's going to show up always in the oldest fronds, and that's very important for you to remember. And it's going to look like it's got spots on it, yellow, orange kind of spots, or sometimes even the those fronds, the tips of them will be frizzled or will look like they're dying, that they're actually necrotic. Um, and it says it can be fatal. Let me explain how potassium deficiency may be fatal. What happens with the potassium deficiency, remember I said it's in the oldest fronds. Palm trees are really very smart trees, and I call them a tree even though they're really a grass, but we all call them trees anyway. What happens is for palm trees, when they can't get the nutrients that they need, they are able to literally translocate from those older fronds to those newer fronds. So even if you have potassium deficiency in those old fronds and you look above, the new fronds look all good. It all looks bright green, looks very healthy. How is it fatal? Because lots of us don't like that look of dead and dying fronds. And so we tend to cut those off. And when we cut those off, what happens is that palm tree still has to get that potassium if we're not putting it in the ground for it. And so as it does, then the next row of fronds turn ugly looking, et cetera, et cetera. Let's take a look at what this really looks like in person in a palm tree. I was describing it to you earlier. You can see on the left-hand side there, you see all of those little yellow spots, that yellow kind of looking. Uh, and then on the right hand side there, you're actually seeing how those, the fronds there uh, are looking necrotic, dying, they're looking dead. Uh, so those are indeed the sheer perfect signs of potassium deficiency. What are you going to do about it? Uh, how are you going to correct it? Well, you can indeed correct it. It may take a long time, so don't expect any kind of a miracle look in your palm looking 
fantastic after you first do this, but you can actually treat it with sulfur coated potassium sulfate. Sulfur coated means it is, or you know, it's not going to melt, so to speak. Uh, it means that it is slow release. Uh, you're going to do that. You're going to apply that three to eight pounds per tree. Again, four times a year. Here we go back to that three months, uh, along with some magnesium sulfate. Um, and like I said, it's not going to be a quick fix in the sense that you're going to see any difference. It's probably going to take up to one to three years to correct. Now, I should probably say to all of you right now, because you're trying to make fast notes and figure out, wait a minute, well, how many pounds with that? Every one of the deficiency, I, deficiencies I'm going to talk about this morning, you can actually go to our EDIS website through the University of Florida. Just type into your web browser the four letters E D I S. And then when you get the search engine, you can search for potassium deficiency in palms, and it'll tell you everything I've just shared with you. Another common deficiency is magnesium deficiency. And you will see magnesium deficiency most frequently in phoenix type palms, the palm that you're seeing here, or phoenix species. The palm you're seeing here is a Canary Island date palm. But you'll also see this magnesium deficiency in sylvester palms, which is another phoenix palm. Uh, if you've got pygmy date palms in your landscape, it'll show up there too. This is very easy to recognize because look at those lower fronds. Again, this is a problem, a deficiency of lower fronds because once again, like I told you earlier, if that top of that palm tree is not getting any magnesium or potassium or nitrogen and fertilizer spread below on the roots, it's going to take it from those oldest fronds. So you'll notice that bright yellow band there with sort of a green center coming down. Uh, that's definitely a sign of magnesium deficiency. Most likely there's also potassium deficiency here because those two typically go hand in hand. If you'll remember what just a second ago when I said how to correct the potassium deficiency, I also said you need to add magnesium at the same time. The reason for it is because these two tend to go hand in hand so most likely what has happened is those very lower fronds, if you can see them kind of hanging down here, probably have had potassium deficiency and then things start to go up. This is a good example of how these particular diseases can, or diseases, I shouldn't say that because they're not diseases. These deficiencies can indeed kill a palm is because you don't like how this all looks. So what do you do? You cut all those bottom fronds off and then guess what? We have very little left at the top. We haven't done the right things. It's going to indeed uh, just keep looking worse and worse. How do you correct this? Well, I know some of you are saying, well, I know what magnesium is. That's Epsom salts. Well, yeah, Epsom salts is, but Epsom salts is very water soluble. So what would happen if you put Epsom salts all around? And again, you're gonna be putting it all, all, all the way out to where you see all those fronds hanging down. Well, because Epsom salts is very water soluble, the first time we get any kind of rain or you run your sprinkler system, guess what? It's all gone. So no, you don't want to indeed use Epsom salts. Again, we're wanting to use slow release. So again, you're looking for something that says prilled or heserite. You're going to treat again with any two to five pounds of magnesium sulfate, again, four times a year, every three months. And then you also want to use potassium <laughs> so you gotta use the two hand in hand and you're going to use potassium basically at that same rate to correct this again are you going to see immediate results no way it's not going to look a whole lot better for a long time this is going to take several years to correct the good news is though because you're doing it then those upper fronds are not no longer needing to translocate what they need from the older fronds so those are really our top deficiencies, but we're going to talk about a few more too. Now we're going to talk about iron deficiency. And I know you're looking at this and say, wait a minute, that doesn't look a whole lot different than potassium. It's got that yellow and there's spots and all of that. Notice that it says on the newest fronds, iron deficiency is a new frond problem and not an old frond problem. Typically, iron deficiency is not going to be an issue. It's 
in your landscape. Uh, most because the reason why iron deficiency typically shows up is because landscape palms are not are not planted correctly. They are plant, planted way too deep. And you'll oftentimes see this like on a whole row of homes coming into like a, maybe a gated community, a resort area where they want all of the palms to look at the same height. Well, in order to do that, uh, there's no way you can buy all those palm trees exactly, probably at 12 foot or 15 foot or whatever. So the palms are planted so they all look the same. Uh, is there any way to correct this? Well, you could use you know, chelated iron and you could actually spray it on the fronds and it might help a little bit, but it's only gonna help for a short time. The only way to correct this particular issue is you gotta replant the palm appropriately or correctly in the first place. Again, like I said, for most homeowners, this is not an issue you're gonna to have to be worried about anyway. Let's look at another one. This one that you probably may see in your landscape, especially if you've got queen palms, that is a queen palm on the left-hand side, and then over on the right-hand side, you're seeing a fan palm. Uh, is this particular manganese, manganese deficiency is actually oftentimes called frizzle top. And you can see why it's going to be called that. If you look on the left side, you can see how those new, and those are all new fronds coming out that are look like they're all crinkled and frizzled or like somebody gave them a home permanent or something. Uh, this is manganese deficiency. It will always be at the top of your tree. It's always going to be in new fronds. So we now you know, realize that we have deficiencies that will always show up in older fronds, and we have deficiencies that will only show up in new fronds. Again, how do you take care of it? Well, it's pretty simple to take care of it. You've just got to get more manganese you know, on your uh, tree. So you want to use manganese sulfate. And again, you're going to be doing it every three months or so. Uh, You'll know when it's corrected because when those, the next new frond comes out, it won't look all frizzled. Uh, so, but again, it's one of those that it takes a while. It doesn't, it's not going to happen overnight. And then the last deficiency we're going to look at is boron. And boron deficiency can, if you see this in your landscape, if you have a palm tree looking like this, we really know it's deficient in boron. Uh, because it actually will start that really sharp bend in the trunk and will actually look like it's growing out to the side. Uh, but also, I want you to notice if you look really closely uh, to the left of this slide, you'll see actually a little another frond coming out looking all crinkled. That's a brand new frond. It should actually be the center of that tree, uh, but it's not. Uh, that tells us for sure that we have boron deficiency. Uh, but another way, for, uh, like foxtails, can actually have boron deficiency. They don't, I mean, they initially will probably make it look, they'll have several spear leaves coming out. Now, sometimes foxtails will put out maybe a couple spear leaves. But if you have a foxtail that's putting out four or five spear leaves, and by spear leaf, I mean that center leaf, then the chances are we have boron deficiency. Boron deficiency, you probably didn't cause it unless you really are irrigating your landscape every day or something. Boron deficiency typically is a water problem. It's typically caused because we have way too much rainfall. So heavy rain or heavy rain in several days can cause it. This is another one of these. It's really, really easy to correct. Uh, and it's almost, I mean, this one you will notice. If, if you get it corrected, it will... That will all straighten up and your palm will start to look very natural again. You're going to treat it with a laundry product. Well, it used to be, <laughs> but you can still buy it. I mean, if you want to, you can treat it with 20 Mule Team Borax. Uh, you can buy that in the laundry aisle. You can use boric acid. Any The basic issue is that you've got to get that uh, borax or boric acid. You're simply going to mix it up in a five-gallon bucket of water. And you're going to literally drench the soil with it. And then in about five months, you'll probably do it again. But this one was almost like a miraculous. You will see a change if you indeed are treating it with boron. Those are the deficiencies. Those are the primary reasons why our palms look sick. Because we simply are not fertilizing them correctly. We're not fertilizing them with the right nutrients at the right times of the year. Uh, so my best advice to you is if you're not fertilizing every three months, get started now. 
I mean, ideally, I mean, we're talking, you know, February, uh, let's see, what, May, you know, before the summer's over, November, yeah. You know, uh, but you can set up your own three month plan in your own landscape. Now let's start to talk about some diseases. The palm diseases that we're gonna talk about this morning include these. Lethal yellowing, and some of these are very severe diseases we're gonna talk about. The second one we're gonna see is lethal bronzing. This is a rather new disease, uh, or at least the name is new. And when we get to it, we'll talk about that and why, but there's the, just notice the two both have lethal in them. Fusarium wilt, we're gonna talk about that. That's when oftentimes you are gonna see showing up in certain types of palms. We're also going to talk about fusarium decline. This is another rather new disease uh, that's come. You know, that's one of the frustrations with Florida. We get lots of new diseases, insects, et cetera. Ganoderma butt rot. Uh, this is one is becoming more common in landscapes all the time, and especially in my landscape. We'll talk about that too. And then the last one, oh, we got two more. We're going to talk about Phytophthora, bud rot. So there's a difference there. Notice it says bud. That means it's going to be at the top of the palm. And then trunk rot. So these are the palm diseases that we're now going to discuss and what you can or cannot do about them and what solutions there are. Lethal yellowing. Lethal yellowing is most often observed in coconut palms. It, it will show up too in Christmas palms, but this is a major problem for and has been a major issue for commercial coconut palm plantations or farms, whatever you want to call them, especially down in the Caribbean, uh, over in the French Polynesian Islands, because coconuts are indeed raised for a lot of products not just for the nuts, but obviously for the oils, for the fibers, et cetera. Uh, so this is a very severe disease. It's actually caused, and I'll kind of say by photoplasm, but for all practical purposes, we can say it's saliva or spit. It's transmitted by a leaf hopper. That's a small insect. And what happens is that leaf hopper feeds on an infected plant and then comes to a plant that's not infected, and then this is what starts to happen. The first symptoms that you're gonna see are, again, on a coconut, is that the flower is never really open, they turn brown, but if they do open and they do get some pollination, you get fruit, you can see there in that photo below how you see that uh, kind of brown staining or rust color staining on there, as well as the fruit's going to drop prematurely. It's never going to drop. It's going to drop early. It's going to drop well before it ever ripens and everything. The next symptom, and you can see that very much on the tree there, you're going to see that the fronds are again, they're starting to yellow, the older fronds, you see how they've turned brown and really dark, and they're starting to hang down parallel to the trunk. That's so again a sure sign that we have lethal yellowing. Uh, if you've got uh, Christmas palms, again, it's going to be on those younger fronds, but they are going to turn not so much yellow, they're going to turn more of a reddish brown. For all of you who, you know, used to travel across the state, and you may realize that, you know, over in Lauderdale, Miami, they used to use coconut palms so much on their streetscapes, and of course, they're not using those either, because, you know, they kind of <laughs> didn't make it either. The good news for us in Charlotte County is that for the most part, lethal yelling is not an issue we have to be concerned about. Uh, it did make its way obviously across the state into Collier County, down the Naples area, and it made its way up into Lee County, but it really never got that far up to Charlotte County. And most likely that has to do with that little leaf hopper that spreads it, is that that little leaf hopper likes it, I think a little more tropical than Charlotte County sometimes is. So our colder weather probably saved us in case of with this. Um, can, you, can you save your palm? If you've got a huge coconut palm or you've got several of them on your canal, you know, you don't want to spend that, you know, you really would like to save them if you can. Well, yeah, <laughs> you can. Uh, you may need some help though, uh, you know, from an arborist or, you know, whatever. Uh, but let's just, 
you know, kind of see here what you can do here. Okay. If over 25% of the fronds are discolored, turning yellow, or they've already turned brown, no, you're done. You're going to have to have it probably taken out. But if it's less than 25%, you can actually inject every four months with an antibiotic. Oxytetracycline is the antibiotic that's used. It's here's, here's your brand name. It's actually called Tree Saver. This is the only source of this product that's registered with EPA for distrib distribution in Florida. You follow the label directions. The chances are most of you as a homeowner are not going to be in the position to inject your palm tree every four months. Uh, therefore, you, if you want to save the palm, you probably do need to call a professional uh, group, an arborist or something like that, you know, you know that can indeed help you. Uh, some of the local, uh, maybe even the people who, if you use uh, particular landscape people, not, not the people who mow your yard, but if you use other landscape uh, groups that actually maybe do some insecticide for you, that you might want to talk to them as they may be able to help with this problem too. So yeah, it's even, you can treat it with an antibiotic, but. Okay, let's talk about lethal bronzing. Again, we had lethal yellowing. <laughs> there should be, a, there's a clue there, lethal bronzing. Um, the leaves don't, <laughs> they turn more bronze than yellow. The first time it really showed up, when I have it here on my screen, slide it says stable palms this is a like i said a newer disease it actually we first discovered it in like 2006 but it was discovered up in hillsborough county and like i said initially it was discovered in stable palms and this is significant because most of us don't have sable palms in our landscape sable palms are native this is the palm that's coming called cabbage palm but oftentimes you find those out in fields and open areas. Uh, they're just not used as much as for landscape palm. So basically nobody noticed this disease. Nobody was paying a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, but then once we began to realize uh, what it was, uh, we also know now, uh, although my slides are gonna show you all sable palms, but we also know now that there's probably over 16 species of palms in Florida that uh, can in actually contract this disease. So the first clue is that there's more dead floor fronds than there should be. And then the second clue is if you look at the top of your tree and you're seeing that the spear leaf has died. Uh, now when that spear leaf dies, what that means is there's no other new fronds gonna come out. But then tips of what you may see as you look at your palm tree is a lower group of fronds that are all dark, brown, dyed, dead, and then you'll see a group of maybe green that may have a little starting to tip, a little bronze. And then finally that very top that is totally gone. The last clue is that the palm canopy is gonna actually collapse around the trunk. Obviously when that all happens, uh, we're, we're done for. Um, this disease too, now let's see, is spread by a leaf hopper. Now the photo that you see here is a very big, it's my, it's, this is not the size of the leaf hopper, obviously it's much smaller than this, but this disease was first discovered in Texas. And that's why we actually called this disease when it first showed up in Florida, we were calling it the Texas Phoenix decline disease because it looked like it was affecting the Phoenix palms in Texas. I should have said, I think it's the Texas Phoenix palm combine. And like I said, it showed up in, you know, in 2006. Now we've got 31 counties that are actually showing it. Obviously, Charlotte County is one of those 31 counties. Uh, I just shared with you, like lethal yellowing, it's spread by an insect. It's that as that insect feeds on a diseased palm and it comes to a palm that's not, it spreads it through its saliva, through its spit, as it feeds. That's how it gets spread. And then basically what you're seeing here is that it can get infected long before you know that there are any symptoms. So, you know, it may take four to five months after that leaf hopper is fed on your palm before the symptoms develop. But once those symptoms are developed, 
the palm's going to die within eight to nine months. There is, can you save it? Can you do something about this one? Well, we're kind of right back to where we were, <laughs> um, you know, with uh, the same issue. Because it's a similar spread by similar things and it's very similar to lethal yellowing, yes, you can actually use that same antibiotic uh, and that may indeed help you uh, save it. So, I mean, that antibiotic that I've already told you, the oxytetracycline uh, and hydrochloride are oftentimes, but if the tree is really far along, and like I said, by the time you notice those symptoms, it's probably going to be too late to actually use um, any kind of antibiotic on it. These are all sable palms, but this gives you an idea of what we were talking about. So if you kind of look here, you'll see there's a lot more dead lower fronds than there should be. You know, this is going around like three, it looks like three or four rows of fronds there. You'll notice how then the top is still a little green, but you'll see here that they're starting to bronze here. You're seeing here the dead, there's no spear leaf even coming out. And then here you're seeing that total collapse of the palm. So it's one of those diseases that, like I said, for the most part, the only management is probably going to be to remove it from your landscape. The next disease we're going to talk about is Fusarium wilt. Okay, now what you need to realize is that the first two diseases we talked about were spread by insects. The next diseases that we're going to talk about are all fungal diseases. And so by that, we mean that there may be some things that indeed we can do or some things we can change in our landscape that may help. Again, Fusarium wilt typically shows up on Canary Island date palms. Uh, but it, as I just told you, it's a fungus. But I want to show you here what happens. If you kind of see how this side of the tree is looking bad, see how this frond down here, half of the frond looks dead, the other half looks still green. You know, same kind of thing you're seeing here is that the symptoms of this disease always begin on the lower fronds and then they move up the canopy. Although there is no cure, this disease can be prevented easily by making sure your pruning tools have been disinfected. It is a major problem of Phoenix palms because of the way we prune Phoenix palms. Canary Island date palms are frequently go by the common name pineapple palm. And you can see why they get that name, because it's pruned to make it look like a pineapple. Well, in so doing that, we've cut off a lot of good fronds that could provide photosynthesis and make that tree a lot healthier, especially if we've got any kind of nutritional deficiencies. If we just cut off all of those fronds that had potassium deficiency and magnesium deficiency, you, you know what's going to happen. We've already talked about that. So it's really a pruning. This is a pruning issue. So you can prevent this disease by simply keeping your pruning tools clean. And right now, with everything we've been going through with COVID, I bet everybody has Lysol in their collection of things that they're using right now. You can disinfect those pruning tools by obviously using Lysol, spraying on them. You can actually use isopropyl alcohol. You know, you can soak them. You can use pine salt. Anything like that that will kill, uh, you know, bacteria will help with this fungicide too. So it's going to actually help you. So the issue is this particular fungus gets spread because whoever you have to prune your trees move from a tree that was already infected to yours and never cleaned their pruning tools or disinfected gloves. And that goes for you too. I mean, even if you're not hiring it done, you should be clean, disinfecting your own. Fusarium decline, I told you it's a new disease in Florida. Again, we're not sure how it got here, but it got here. And initially we called it the queen palm disease because it was basically only affecting queen palms. Uh, for the most part, it, it does only affect typically queen palms and uh, Mexican fan palms. Uh, but what it does is it sort of freeze dries them. And you'll see a photo here in a little bit. But you'll notice that what it does again, this one starts on the lower canopy. So again, 
queen palms typically won't have all of these dead fronds in the bottom. They might have one or two, uh, but they're not going to have all of these. Uh, so you'll see here in this where we've, they, we've actually, this is a photo from the university, where we've actually show you here are the lower fronds. And then as you move up, so you can see those have all died. You move up. These are starting to get yellow on the, the sides, on the tips. And then we get to the green fan. So here's that freeze-dried look. Looks like a, a palm tree, except that everything's brown on it now. And here's a, uh, a photo of the Mexican fan palm. You may also know this palm as a uh, um, Washingtonian palm. So, but you can see here how these have all died and how the upper uh, fronds are starting to, to look that way too. Um, it's a fungal disease. Can you do anything about it? Mm, probably not. Once you see it, it's kind of like all these others. Once you get to this point, about the only management thing you can do is probably remove it from your landscape because there are lots of spores here. Okay, now we're going to talk about another one. This is Ganoderma butt rot. Um, and I mentioned earlier that this is one I'm fighting in my landscape. I've had one palm removed because of it. I'm afraid I'm going to lose another one too. Again, it's a fungus. The fungus that's this one is actually, there's all kinds of Ganoderma funguses. But this one is only, only likes palm trees. So it's not going to eat or attack or make or die or kill any other necessarily ornamental in your landscape. But it sure doesn't, it sure likes palms. It is a soil borne fungus. Uh, so what happens is, and you're kind of seeing here, you see how this overall decline. But I want to show you here, these, these particular, this is a showing you the cutting of a, of a trunk of a, a diseased tree of Ganoderma butt rot. Because the disease always spreads kind of from the center out. So you'll see as we cut and you'll see how this one's really dark, this is dark. We get up here and get a little further on, you're actually seeing then how the very top of the, the trunk looks pretty healthy. Uh, so it always, you know, starts and it will always start in the lower part, the lower four to five foot of the trunk. Uh, I want to point out, and I already mentioned, there is no palm that is resistant to this disease. This disease is fatal. There is nothing you can do to save this palm. And because no palm is resistant, and remember I said Gan Ganoderma only likes to attack palm trees. Once you remove the palm from your landscape, you cannot plant another palm. And the reason being for that is, remember I said it's soil borne. Even though it doesn't start in the roots, it actually starts going up the trunk. But those roots all have Ganoderma in them. Remember I told you very early in my presentation, but those roots of those palms can be 25 to 50 foot away from the trunk of the palm. There is absolutely no way you're ever going to get all those roots out of the ground for your palm that you just have removed because it was dead from Ganoderma. Here is a sure tail sign. You will always know if you have Ganoderma if you start to see this. And these conch like structures that you see here always will be probably anywhere within, you see this is very close to the soil line, you know, it can be all the way up into the lower four or five for the trunk. You'll never see them up higher. They're always going to be here. If you see these, there's no question. Indeed, the fungus has spread all through the tree and it's starting to come out like this. The only thing you can do if you have this issue in your landscape is to have this palm removed. And as I said, you never will plant another palm there. You can plant a gardenia there. You can plant a hibiscus. You could plant, you know, a crepe myrtle. You can plant other things, but no palm trees. Phytophthora bud rot, another fungal disease, but it affects the top of your palm, the bud of the palm. And again, initially, you know, you're going to see some discoloration. You're going to see wilting of that sphere leaf. It's actually not going to ever open. The problem is by the time you realize, because we aren't 
typically you are not out looking at your palms at the very top of the palm tree. Uh, so, so oftentimes we don't even notice that this is a problem because the older fronds still look good because they all came out of the bud before the fungus was there or before the bud died. Uh, can you again correct this? Is there anything you can do? Um, it depends. Uh, Phytophthora oftentimes becomes an issue for very stressed palms. And I've been in Florida for a long time. So I do remember when we had some very freezing weather and a lot of those royal palms that grow down in Fort Myers along McGregor were actually treated at that point in time for Phytophthora. But you all, you know how tall a royal palm gets. So that means you probably don't have the equipment. You probably have to hire somebody who can come in and basically you're going to drench the trunk. And that's what you have to do in order to correct or to treat Phytophthora. It's spread by spores, all fungus is, and it's going to be either splashed, you know, or blown from palm to palm or by infected pruning tools. But there are fungicides. There are fungicides that are specific only for this fungus, Phytophthora, and you know they can be used. But like I said, it's very difficult to reach up there. So you're gonna have to probably have uh, a, just one of those big <laughs> cherry picker kinds of trucks or whatever to get, get up to the bud. The fungicides that are approved for Phytophthora are these two, Subdue or Aluac. You as a homeowner can buy them. The problem is they don't come in very homeowner sizes. Uh, you typically probably don't need 75 gallons of uh, Aluet or Subdue uh, to treat one palm tree. Again, most likely if you've got bud rot, you're going to remove the palm. And now here's trunk rot, another fungal issue. So you'll notice that so far all the diseases we've talked about, only two have an insect vector. The first two we talked about, lethal yelling, lethal frond, everything else is a fungal issue. Again, this typically happens because you put a nail in your palm tree or somebody put a nail in your palm tree. Don't hang Christmas lights on your palm tree with a nail. Uh, and oftentimes you will see this bleeding kind of look, which will definitely tell you that you have, you know, trunk rot. Again, can you do anything with it? Yeah, you, know, you might take, you know, a uh, copper salt that you might try just pouring a fungicide in that general area and let it run down the trunk. Uh, this may or may not kill your tree, but it will sure make your tree uh, not as stable and obviously not as attractive. So we've now talked about nutritional problems. We've talked about diseases. Let's talk about insects. You're seeing the insects here that most likely can affect your palms. We're going to talk about palm leaf skeletonizer, palmetto weevo, red palm mite, which again is a kind of a new bug, and Rugglusparium white fly, which is a rather new, well, yeah, it's still a new issue too. Um, that's not to say that other insects can't affect your palms. Palms can be affected by scale. They could be affected by aphids. But for the most part, palm trees are large enough that even if you had an infestation of the scales or aphids, it's not going to damage or hurt your palm. Just as palm leaf skeletonizer will probably not kill your palm. Palm leaf skeletonizer is actually what causes it is the larva of a moth. And so she lays her eggs. And so what you're seeing in that top slide, uh, for uh, better ways of saying it, I mean, the right way to say it is that you're seeing caterpillar frass basically is caterpillar poop that's what's happening and so the caterpillars when they hatch out from the eggs actually start to eat the palm frond and so you'll see in you know if you look in that lower screen there or the lower slide you're going to see that skeletonized look how you know you can kind of see through it you can see they're only eating parts of the palm frond uh, so they give it that kind of uh you know they're eating around those leaf veins. They leave the leaf veins. Uh, is this going to kill your palm? Probably not. The chances are I almost 100% it's not going to kill. This is more of a cosmetic issue. So your fronds don't look as pretty. Uh, I've had this one on some areca palms before. Yeah, no big deal. Do you want to do it if you want to treat it? You can treat it uh, with the same product that you'd use to 
use caterpillars or get rid of caterpillars in other ways. There's a product called BT. It's best. It's a bacteria. It's a bacterium. You actually spray it on your uh, palm. You spray it on these foliar spray. You're gonna spray it up there. And then as those caterpillars feed, they ingest that bacterium. So BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, and you can buy it in any home garden store. And it's like I said, it works great uh, to kill caterpillars. Uh, whether we're talking palm leaf skeletonizers, or if you're talking only empty caterpillars, it'll work either way. Palmetto weevil is a very large bug. <laughs> you can, you'll be able to see this with your eye, naked eye, because they get about three quarters to one and a quarter inches long. Uh, they vary in color, but typically they'll always be almost red and black. There'll be some red and some black in the in three different kinds of ways. But what hurts your palm from this particular insect isn't the actual adult weevil at all. It's the larva or the grubs. Uh, they are legless and they look just like the same kind of grub typically that you oftentimes can find in your uh, turf grass, long grass. Uh, but it's them. They actually, as they feed, they're going to destroy the bud or the butt, what do you want to call it, the bud, that center section of the palm. That's where they're going to be and that's where they're going to feed. So let's take a look here. There's that larva. With the penny, you can see the size. They actually can, I almost think they are almost as big as your thumb sometimes. Here are examples of two of them. See, there's always kind of a red and black. You can see that weevil. See, there's there that. You always know that that's a weevil. Being held here, this is, you can see, there's one of the larvae. That's one of those grubs. And you see how it's been feeding along in there. Why do you get palmetto weevils? Well, you typically get them because your palm is stressed in some kind of way. It could be stress from over pruning, such as the case with like Canary Island date palms because we keep trying to make them look like pineapples. Your palm tree could be stressed because of cold damage or even freeze damage. Oftentimes that happens because we are planting palms that are really designed to grow in hardiness zones 10 and we're planting them in hardiness zones nine. For example, in Charlotte County, um, there are certain palm trees that ideally you should not be planting across the river because our hardiness zone changes there. Uh, so one of the main problems that we've seen with palm mantle weevils has lately been with Bismarck palms, and that's that huge, large, silver kind of palmy palm uh, that grows very large. What happens is, and that was one of those that perhaps was indeed uh, damaged by cold, a Bismarck palm is a, uh, again, a zone 10 or hardiness zone 10 or 11 palm. But then once you start planting it up as far as North Pole, you potentially have much colder weather. And so what happens is the female palmetto vivo can smell a diseased or a stressed palm. I shouldn't say disease, a stressed palm. And so that palm gives off a particular odor that she likes, so she stops. And then she gives off pheromones, or she makes then the male decide that, wait a minute, this sounds really good. The male stops, the two get together, and the rest is history. There's that, you know, grubby larva that you see there. And so what happens is as that larva is feeding on the bud, Again, in palm trees that are so tall, you don't even know what's happening until the palm tree actually starts to collapse and bend over. So palmetto weevils uh, can indeed cause major damage to palm trees. Red palm mite, a rather new insect, not a major problem yet, uh, but it's distributed by wind current. So guess how we got it, you know, again, those of you who are here with us year round, you know that we get tropical storms, we get hurricanes, or even today we've got some high wind going too. What happens is it gets spread by the wind or it came in on infested plants. Now that's another problem that we have in the state of Florida is that we are have lots of places, lots of uh, ports that plants come into from the tropics or from the Caribbean. 
and oftentimes those indeed have this on that we didn't realize. The palms that are affected, again, they're going to start to show yellow spots. So you're going to say it looks a whole lot like potassium deficiency, uh, but it shows all the way through the leaf surface. Uh, again, you, I mean, you can see here how, you know, and this looks like it may even be a coconut palm that is affected here. They are actually visible because they're so bright red, but this is what they actually look like. Uh, but again, you'd have to look way up into the canopy of the tree uh, to know that you've got them. Uh, can you treat them? Well, yeah, you can if you can get up there and take care of it. Then the Regulus spiraling white fly. And I said it's a new, it's a new insect. It was new. It's it's kind of we've sort of got it under control now, and we got it under control because we have introduced parasitic wasps that like to they lay their eggs on the white fly, and then the their their larva digest the white fly, and then takes care of it. But when it first showed up a few years ago, it started to show up on palm trees, and of course, a lot of the palm trees were over on uh, Boca Grande on the island, and people over there spent a lot of money to have big palm trees, and they didn't like that powdery white look on them. So you can see how it gets its name, see how it the spiraling here as it delays its eggs. This is what it can look like on a palm tree. Could you, can you correct it? You can correct it the same way you would do if you had white flies on your hibiscus. The difference is this is a much larger area that you're trying to take care of. So like I said, it's not an issue now as much as it was. It's not only palm trees that the Regulus bar and white fly likes. There's lots of host plants. Uh, it likes gumbo limbos. It likes all kinds of other plants. But like I said, it's really not the problem that we've had that we had in the past. I'm going to finish up with some really quick things that these are perfectly normal things that happen with your palm trees and they have nothing to do with disease or nutrition or anything. Root, you'll oftentimes see palm trees that get this flare on their trunks because here are all these roots are. When this palm tree was planted, all this mulch was up here as it's growing up. No, not a problem. You'll also see it kind of look like this. Oftentimes you'll see this with royal palms. You'll see it with foxtail palms too, nothing to worry about. As a matter of fact, if we put this mulch and we put it all back up, those roots would probably become viable again. Uh, there's plenty of roots. Remember I told you they're no bigger than your little finger? There you see. Trunk problems. These happen to be Washingtonian palms, but what you're seeing here, and you'll see it oftentimes with sable palms too, is those boots hang on. So as those fronds die, it takes a while. Eventually, those boots may all come off, uh, but it may take a long time for it to happen. It's not an issue that you need to be concerned about. Leaf problems, oftentimes, and you'll see this sometimes on fox, lots of times on foxtails, you see this little black looking stuff that you initially may think is black sooty mold. It's not. It's called scurf, and it's not going to hurt that. And here you'll see this is on a Bismarck. On a Bismarck, it looks like cinnamon. It's kind of that cinnamon color. All of these are perfectly normal things to happen. Like I said in the beginning, if you need more information about anything I've shared or talked about, just go to the University of Florida EDIS website. So in the search engine, you can put in palm nutrition and you'll find out exactly how much how to fertilize. You can put in, like I said, common palm diseases. You'll find all those, or you can individually look them up. Uh, those are all possible things, easy for you to take care of. With that, I'm all done.